in between you and lunch. So that's not a, an enviable place to be, but that's okay. Uh, this next presentation was actually developed, and I'm, I'm given uh, on behalf of Nathan Klaus, who is also with the Georgia DNR. And uh, you, if you look through the stack of, of papers that you have uh, in front of you this morning, is a publication from the Long Leaf Alliance Long Leaf Leader magazine uh, that Nathan put together uh, a couple of years ago now. And uh, this presentation essentially is, is, is playing off of what's in this uh, packet. So I highly recommend you take this home and read it. Uh, and his contact information is at the end of this presentation. And if it's not, um, I don't think you have that in the publication here. It's at the end of the presentation here. And we'll also have this email in this presentation on the share folder uh, that you all have access to uh, after the workshop today. So if you have any questions, uh, he's really the guy to, uh, to ask about this. But I wanted to make sure that we were able to share uh, his information. He really wanted to be here today, but he had, he had some other commitments and, and was not able to make it. So all of the work that he's been doing uh, that, that went into this, this presentation and, and then this uh, article <laughs> Uh, comes from his work uh, on the, and, and it's because I'm not from around there, I would say it's Spreewell Bluff, but I was corrected last night that it's a non-Georgian, it's Spruel. Yep. Yeah, I heard a yep, okay. All right, Spruel Bluff. Uh, so, this is a place with scattered old growth montane longleaf, all right, so keep that in mind. That's kind of your grain of salt as we work through the the, uh, the information here today. So these these are sites uh, that I haven't been there. I'd love to. This is a Philip Juris uh, <clears throat> painting from what looks kind of like an oak glade. And then this these are some shots of Sproul of today. A lot of topographic topographic relief. Uh, I was talking to Nathan the other day on the phone and. I was asking, have you done any raking of the trees? And he's like, yeah, and some of, we've done some experiments where we, we, we raked it down until we hit rock. <laughs> I was like, what? You hit rock? <laughs> so I, I already know you, you're, you're raking long leaf and hitting rock. This is not something I think about very long step often. So yeah, just again, these Montane long leaf sites, but uh, they inherited this piece of property with quite a bit of doubt, right? Average duff depth nine inches across the site, and so they, Nathan and his um, work at trying to manage this beautiful piece of property over the years without uh, killing it and nuking it uh, with this duff load, he's he's kind of trial and error come come together with this system of uh, prescriptions for using the moisture meter. Right, he's kind of bought off the shelf, and we'll have it in the field this afternoon. You can get hands on with it and, and, and see what you think. Uh, but he's been using this, this moisture meter uh, and to come up with some standard prescriptions. So prior to, to dealing with this, they, their standard prescription was to burn uh, with, with one inches or more. Rain was their burns were in February and March. And so because of that standard prescription, at the time, they only had four to five burn days per year for the site. Right? That's not a whole lot of opportunity to get a fire off to a site. And, it, and as, as he says, it was really uh, guesswork, right? You know, they were kind of, you know, stick your hand down in the duck, and kind of get a feel for it, and say, what is it, what enough today? That's great. So what they found was that um, that was not a very good a method for moving forward with such a, a, a beautiful piece of property. And it was kind of hard to teach that technique. It's not quantitative, right? No qualitative, so you couldn't necessarily teach his new folks that were coming on his fire crews. Well, how wet is too wet? Yeah. All right, so he, he picked up this thing called a Delmhorst Del uh, moisture meter. Has anybody here used one of these? Yeah. You got one, Curtis? Is that similar to what you guys have used at St. Mark's? No. 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 So this is, uh, it's, Fairly inexpensive, 300 bucks, 400 bucks, something like that. Runs off a 9 volt battery. And uh, he's had pretty good luck with this system so far. So it's, it just comes in a little box, and uh, it's not designed for what he's doing with it. 
right? It's designed to, to measure moisture content in drywall, lower moisture content in dimensional lumber, something like that. It has these two short probes on the end. Uh, but what he's found is that uh, he'll go up to a tree and he'll sample maybe 20 different trees across the site the day before he plans to burn. And he'll stick these really short probes into the duff without compressing it, and that's one of the key points he suggested we emphasize. Don't compress it, just stick it into the probe. So stick it into the duff at different levels, different prizes. And it'll give you a, a percent and a, a scale of, of zero to 100%, and he'll go around a whole bunch of different trees the day before. And then on the morning of, uh, he'll kind of use that the day before as sort of his go or no go, right? And if he feels like the, the duck moisture levels are, are where uh, he wants them to be, then he'll go ahead. And, and in the morning, he said, too, he'll sometimes send a tech one of his burn crew members to go out and sample one more time around some of these trees. And the technique, and it's described in here, but he recommends it kind of you know, take some, some samples of, of the moisture at the surface, scoop down a little bit, take some more samples at the lower horizons, too. Because as has been mentioned earlier today, you know, you're going to find different levels of moisture content. Sometimes it's those subsurface, uh, drier horizons that will be the gotchas, right? So, you know, this is the slide. If, if you're interested in trying to apply this to your area, granted, this is Montana Longleaf, right? In, in probably different soils than most of what most folks here in this room are working on. But these are the thresholds uh, that Nathan has found using this particular instrument. I would not uh, suggest using those same thresholds with a different instrument, right? Because this is an application uh, that, that this thing's not even designed to use. But it's been consistent for him, which is why he wrote the long leaf article and why he was interested in sharing it today. Is that Above 80%, above 85% of <coughs> you're golden in his, in his case. And, and I asked him, I said, all right, Nathan, is this, are you still losing trees? Because he's, he, he's been doing this now, I think, for about 10 years with this particular instrument and tracking it. And he said, you know, yes, still losing some trees, but this is on, uh, I forget how many, anybody remember how many acres? Uh, this rule bluff is, it's a pretty sizable tract. Uh, and and he's, he's comfortable with it. And I asked him, have you started using this application in uh, this instrument in particular in, in, uh, in flatwood sites? He said, not really. So there's your other grain, of, right? This is something that he's developed in his work over there. And you know, the idea is it may, with with practice and with uh, consistency on your neck of the woods, it might be a way to track it. Of course, your mileage may vary, right? <laughs> so set the meter percent scale. Like we said, pull away some of the, the upper uh, fluffy horizons of the dust. Get the probes in. And, and the nice thing about this is the reading is instantaneous, right? So you click it in, you push a button, and there's your number. Move it to another spot, push a button, and there's your reading. And there's your reading. And so you can very quickly, and that's what he likes about it, very quickly uh, take a number of different samples on the site and then move on to another tree. But he emphasized too, and as it would make sense in, a, in particular in this area, you know, aspects play a big uh, uh, role in some of the uh, factors that go into the duck moisture on these montane sites. And of course, as we know, uh, rainfall is highly heterogeneous. And so, you know, he'll take samples on different sides of the trees, different units with different areas within the burn unit that day. All right, his take home message here. How not to screw this up? I like this. Take lots of readings, if in doubt, 20 trees total. Sampling three areas in your unit is reasonable within 20 minutes, so it doesn't take too long. And take readings from different parts of the unit, and try to pick out those problem areas, and those are the ones you want to monitor, right? Because it, it doesn't make sense to monitor your duff moisture in the areas that you think that uh, you won't have an issue. It's the one, the drier spots are the ones that are going to come back and bite you. Emphasize too on this particular instrument: don't squeeze or compress the duff, right? Because this is looking at all 
moisture, but it's looking at electrical conductivity, right, across the two rows. And so by squeezing it, you're kind of manipulating that conductivity and you're going to skew your readings, which kind of defeats the whole point. And again, uh, his last bullet there is, is getting at those, sampling those different horizons, because as we've seen, it's going to vary. So he's losing lower mortality, most of his valuable trees, We're losing 1 to 3% of trees, in his case, over a 10 year period of reintroducing fire to this site. And that it's easy to train anybody in your crew to use this instrument. It's, it's very easy to see, you'll see in the field this afternoon, it, it doesn't take a lot to learn how to use it. And they found in their case, that instead of waiting for a specific prescription based on burn days by opening up uh, their prescriptions to, to other days based on duff fuel moisture, they opened up their opportunities to burn the site. And that was key for him as a manager, right? Instead of five days per year, he now had more days to burn. And that's key. So uh, there's the product name, and it's also in here on your uh, sheet if you're interested in picking up one of these. It bounces around the back of this truck, right? So it's not exactly the most sensitive piece of technological equipment. Uh, he mailed it to me, U.S. Postal Service, and just slapped a label on it, wrapped it in duct tape, and it showed my door, and it seems to work. So that's pretty good. Uh, and you know, it's not terribly expensive. There are uh, other probes that you can get to screw into this particular instrument that are longer and have uh, different um, designed applications, but I asked him, I said, have you tried those? And he said, don't we just use the stock ones. Fair and there's his contact information. So Nathan is really excited to have you talk about this kind of instrument that he's used and his application of it. Um, so if you have specific questions about what he's done with it, I would really encourage you to go forward. He's a, he's a talker. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that. Any questions? Yes, sir. So that's a good comment. Kevin and I have a paper on using the, um, the Campbell duff moisture meter that costs like 1700 bucks. Is that what it is? Um, and uh, our results are not as good. <laughs> yeah. Is that the one you did with? With David? David? Yeah. yeah. So I'll send that to you. I have. That's already on the share. Card. Okay. All right. So, yeah, they're on this folder that I'll send to everybody on the on the list on the roster. Uh, I pulled together a whole bunch of the primary literature that um, that both Morgan and Kevin referred to this morning, and that uh, particular publication from 2007 or something like that uh, is in there as well. And they they it was an off the shelf product. Um, you guys did. Mm -hmm. Was that a workway? It was. Yeah. And Eglin too, I think. And a different kind of instrument. Yeah, Campbell, so it's like. It's like a little can. Yeah. Greg, is that what y'all use? What do you use? No, we, it's, a, it's called a Sartorius moisture meter. Oh, it's, that's right, you showed me a picture. Yeah, yeah it's. I'm, a, I'm almost embarrassed now to tell you how much it costs. And it. this sounds, a, this is very promising to me because. You could calibrate that. You go out, take multiple samples really quick. We have to go out, take samples, put them in a baggie, bring them back, and it right. takes 15 or 20 minutes to dry and weigh each sample. It's very, very precise, but we don't need to the tenth of a percent moisture. You know, we just need to be in a range. So this sounds really good. And I think what you hit on there was in terms of calibrating it to your site. So. Yeah. The tool is just a tool, and it's just—it's all right. about learning how you could use it on your site to get more consistent. Right. Results. We may need to reference it to the scale Absolutely. we're already using, but yep. this would be—we could take a hundred times the yep. number of measurements it takes us now to do one. So if it if it matches consistently with your scale, then just yep. the crosswalk, and, and you're yeah, you're on. We may be buying. It, it uses only a, <laughs> a nine volt battery, and I said, how long does a battery last? He said, a year. So. Pretty expensive to YouTube. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, all the speakers that we had this morning.